Lord, take our minds and think through them. Take my lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for your son, Jesus. Take our wills and put them in submission to yours. In Jesus Christ's holy and blessed name we pray. Amen. Well, again, good morning. Uh, those of you from Grace Church will again be a little surprised. I've only done this three or four times since I've been here. Uh, but I'm going to read this sermon. And particularly because uh, this week has been a poetic week for me. And uh, those of you who know poets, it's hard to let go of words. And as I went through this sermon, I just couldn't let go of the paper. Um, for me, there were just too many things that I wanted to say, and I didn't want to go off into a long tangent. Also, I'm doing this to keep the timing a little slow. I'm aware that you prefer, many of you prefer when I'm extemporaneous. Um, I hope on this Easter Sunday, you will indulge me with this message. So it has been four weeks since we have seen each other, most of us face to face, and I miss all of you greatly, your shining faces and your loving hearts. I have to be honest that for those two first weeks, two and a half first weeks, I think I was in some form of muted shock, moving slowly, reacting slowly, maybe even some sort of low level PTSD. Now, not that I've ever seen a bomb go off, except in movies, of course, um, and I've never been to war either, obviously, but it felt like, for me at least, those first few weeks as if a bomb had gone off in my life, in the life of the church, in the life of the world. Things were missing. Minds and hearts were in shock. I remember a couple scenes, of course, uh, in a couple of my favorite World War II productions, Saving Private Ryan and Band of Brothers, where bombs or shells explode, and they film the scenes in this kind of muted, slow motion. You literally feel confused and blocked watching it. This is just a small glimmer of how I kind of felt those first few weeks during this pandemic. I felt cut off from all of you, from the communal work of the church, sad and worried for my friends and family all over the world, realizing that the world as we knew it had changed. But by week three into four, I began to get some, uh, some feeling back in my limbs. Creativity and prayer and hope began to bubble, bubble up just a little bit. Um, and in that transition from disaster to slow awakening, for some strange reason, I began to reminisce to contemplate moments of other disaster that had occurred in my life. I began to think about these, how they had occurred, perhaps how I had felt or you had felt during and after them. And what slowly happened then, as life seemed to return, in each case, differently, but returning nonetheless. In particular, with the idea of thinking of bombs going off and changing the environment, led me to reflect on a few major disasters in particular loosely comparing some of my feelings and perspective, and maybe yours, to what happened then and what is happening now. Now, of course, there are a lot of differences between all these events, but some general similarities, I think. And for no particular reason, and in no particular order, I began to think of the eruption of Mount St. Helens, Hurricane Katrina, the tsunami that hit Asia, and of course, September 11th. In each case, some variation of destruction, chaos, death, and confusion, as if a bomb had gone off, and in some cases, it almost literally did. And then slow motion life as we all tried to figure it all out. I realize, of course, that the virus is not the same type of event, but I hope you catch my meaning on an emotional and spiritual level. I think we were all, and are all, rocked to our cores and can continue to be in a variety of ways. Now, in contemplating these previous terrible events, I began to think of two different scenarios. First, that though the bomb went off and there was destruction from a volcano and a tsunami and a hurricane and terrorism, slowly and surely, biological life reappeared and took over again. Communities rebuilt, at least to some extent. Life kept going. 
But secondly, I began to think more seriously about the emotional and spiritual response and destruction and how it began to manifest itself in the ways that people may have handled the situations after the initial wave of chaos and fear. How they dealt with it later was varied from individual to individual and community to community. And yet I think we could see in instances how the hearts of those who had survived and witnessed the destruction would come to show who they truly were, how they truly felt, how they truly believed. Now, to be clear, I am not a sociologist. I have no degree in sociology. This is just my own personal reflection. Just wanted to make sure, because I know there's some people I don't know watching this. I am just a minister. I do have a wildlife biology degree, but that's pretty useless. No sociology. But I think that there are perhaps a few general ways, and, and obviously others, but for today, a few general ways that we can see, look at, reflect on the, the types of people and how they reacted in these common type situations. For today, I want to talk about four typical ways that I think people tend to react in these situations. First, there are those who for a variety of known and unknown reasons hold on to the fear and the sadness and have an impossible or really hard time moving on. This is, of course, normal for human beings. But for some people, it's, it's literally impossible. They get stuck in this bomb shelter mentality and they can't move, they can't do anything, and they can't get out. Second, there are what we may call fixers. What Mr. Rogers would call the helpers. These are the people who looked at the disasters and immediately began to work on ways to solve them, ways to prevent such widespread death and destruction from occurring the next time. We might see geologists and weather scientists working on better ways to warn people of upcoming disasters, engineers and other scientists working to warn people on better ways to stay safe during those events, maybe military and police forces working on new ways to share information to stop more destruction and to protect the communities. There are, of course, all sorts of other examples. But for some people, the way to respond to chaos is to walk right into it and to try to figure out how to fix it or help change it. Thirdly, there are those who, people who, for a variety of reasons, some, I think, who are continuing to hold on to that anger and fear at the chaos, immediately seek to blame and finger point at whoever could have handed him causing this or not helping in the situation. In addition to the blamers, we have their cousins, the deniers, those who can't see the truth of the good or the bad in these situations and instead seek to instill fear in the population by theorizing and spreading lies about the events. And lastly, I think as a group we might recognize as the philosophers and the theologians in culture, who coming out of the disaster within these first few weeks begin to look at the situation and wonder, what comes next? For us as a species and as a community and as a church, what do we do now and in the future as rational, communal, loving human beings? It was a, one of these last type of people uh, working to look into the future of what might happen who got me thinking for today's sermon. I read an article online on Friday, and I, I know a few of you read it because I know you shared it on Facebook. And it was an article in which the author theorized about how big business and government are going to push us very, very, very quickly to do whatever it takes to get back to normal even if the timing isn't right. And they will seek to push us forward, even if the moving toward normal in some way covers up all the fear and the worry and the problems that had arisen in the last few months. And they would push us and do all this, even if we have to pretend or lie about everything that we've seen in regards to the brokenness in our culture, government, and personal lives come to light as we've been forced to choose essentials and non-essentials 
And they would push us back to normal, even though we've seen how the economy or the ecosystem apparently has been reacting favorably in some places because human beings were doing the less of whatever it is that we do out there. And they would push us quickly to return back to normal, even though clearly we have now seen magnified many obvious disparities of race, creed, and wealth under the light of a shutdown economy and social distancing. Now this author called this time that we are living in the great pause. And I'm not sure if he coined that. And he philosophized some questions along with his theory. Will we take the time to learn during this pause time? Learn what we have seen with slowed eyes and fresh perspective in the world? Or will we just work to get back to what we know, the broken ways we did them before? Will we just rush to get back to normal? Will our need to return to normal cause us to forget the realities that each of us has seen in our personal and communal lives? What is important? What is not? What is broken? And what is unfixable? Now, I'm not really sure how I feel about his theory about big business and government. That's not my point to quote on here right now. But I have to admit, probably like most, if not all of you, the idea of being back to normal again sounds like sweet honey to me. Like fond stories of days gone by, like an ice cold lemonade on a hot August day in 100% humidity in Old Sable, Connecticut. Ah, normal. Unfortunately, there are a couple of problems with wanting or seeking to want to return to normal. First, I think we've seen too much of the details of the essential brokenness of the interconnected world up close and personal in new and varied ways these past weeks strewn across the internet and the TVs. Too many questions of what is essential and what is not essential have now been put under the microscope and the reality of our deeper hearts and minds has changed, I think, too much to be able to be, ever go back to what was before, what was in just January or December. It also been clear in that moment, in the midst of that thought, that it is true and right and human to mourn the passing of that normalcy. That sense of routine that most of us used to have, it's okay to be sad that we have lost it. And second, reflecting on why I don't think we can return to normalcy. Let us reflect on the words of Paul today in Colossians 3. If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you will also be revealed with him in glory. And let us consider the gospel passages for the last week, from Palm Sunday to Good Friday, today, the cross, the resurrection. For by our faith in Jesus and his cross, we are saved and forgiven of our sins. In Christ, we have in fact died to sin, and our life is now hidden with him in God. For God loved us so much that even God, even spirit, became human and died for us on the cross. And in Christ now, we are led by the Holy Spirit to become holy children of God on our way to eternal life, not only here, but eventually in heaven. There is nothing normal about this story, about the way God came to seek and save us and invite us by faith into this story. For those of us who follow Jesus Christ, or even those who are seeking Jesus Christ, normal died on the cross 2,000 years ago. Hear the word of God from the mouth of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 43, verses 18 and 19. 
Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And again, in the words of Jesus from the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 5, and he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. I am making all things new, God said. I am making all things new, Jesus said. Not normal, but new. Nothing Jesus did or does is normal. And because of that, the lives of those who followed him then and now were and can no longer be normal either. It was not a normal thing for someone to go around healing everyone and casting out demons and raising the dead to life. This was a whole type of new. It would not be normal for regular people to completely change their lives to follow a Galilean carpenter rabbi who preached the kingdom of God. And not only follow, but leave their homes and jobs and family as well. And not only that, but be willing to preach in the face of Roman and Jewish leadership oppression, which would lead to beatings and death. That was not normal. This was a whole type of new. If following Christ today were normal, perhaps there would be 8 billion Christians instead of just 2 billion. If Christianity was normal, maybe there would be churches opening on every street corner instead of closing. If God wanted normal, he wouldn't have come to dwell and save us. Instead, he could have just left us to decide what we think is normal and let us go about our business. Yet instead, God came in Christ to make all things new. Normal is more often easy for most of us, not all of us. In many ways, normal is what is expected, routine, and understood. New, on the other hand, is strange and confusing, terrifying and overwhelming for most people. As they often say, we fear what we don't understand. And perhaps, just perhaps, this is why so many people then and even now deserted and disbelieved Jesus. It seems that humanity has always wanted normal then and now, and yet, God gives us new. This new was planted into our hearts by our faith in Jesus. Manifested through the Holy Spirit in our baptism, we come to share in the death and resurrection of Jesus, into the water of dying, out of the water alive with new life in Christ. This new seed planted within us will come to grow as we follow and learn from and talk to Jesus in prayer. We will hear the teaching and seek it to follow it in our own various ways to pick up our own crosses and follow him. To die daily to ourselves, the world, and said and sin, and instead be fed and clothed by him in his light, in his light. And there, there we find that the love and forgiveness and mercy and healing grace of God begins to grow and fruit through our lives, which we then can share with the world as hope and charity. And as you may have guessed again, none of this is normal. This is God making all things new. And so the new replaces the normal. And in Christ, we find ourselves learning and growing, being better able to forgive than to blame, to share truth rather than lies, to help others instead of hurt them, to love others instead of hating or judging them. We find our new is in Christ, hidden with God. It is not the normal of the world.
being overwhelmed with fear and worry at times like this, during this viral pandemic, in a broken and darkened world, is unfortunately a very normal human response. Very normal. However, it is seeking the peace and joy in Jesus Christ in the midst of that fear that is a new thing. And it is a calling from our God. My brothers and sisters, through his death on the cross for our sins and his resurrection into new life, Jesus has opened not only the tomb, but the door to his kingdom and invited us to join him in this new life, this resurrection life, this Easter life. The same invitation that brought you to Jesus or to church years ago, the same invitation that existed four months ago when we didn't even know about this virus, the same invitation from Jesus is given to you today to join in making all things new. And no matter what your place or situation in life, no matter who you are and where you are right this moment, Jesus is calling to you, calling to you to stand up in the midst of this darkness so that you, through the power of the Holy Spirit, can share the gift and the love and the power of Jesus with the world at this time, in the weeks and months to come. So let us together, today and all days to come, join Jesus Christ in making all things new, not just normal. Now and forever. Amen. Will you pray with me? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, come. Come forth through us. Come through us, Lord Jesus, this day. Make us new. Lord Jesus, strengthen us and heal us and set us forth upon the world, Lord Jesus, fill with your light and your life. This Easter day, Lord Jesus, may every person who hears my voice, may every Christian on this planet, may every person who is seeking the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, be filled with you. May we not be worried about the normal. May we only seek the new in you, Jesus. May we be filled with the peace and the joy and the love of God in all we do, in all that befalls us in the weeks and months to come. May we know you and only you, Lord Jesus, as our Savior and our God. In your name we pray.